and welcome to the 2021 edition of the State of the Union organized by the European University Institute in Florence. My name is Ellen Immergut, Professor of Political Science and Head of Department of the Department of Political and Social Sciences at the EUI. I'm delighted to introduce the panel Ethics and Efficiency in Vaccine Distribution. We're focusing on the efficiency, ethics, and policy trade-offs regarding competing vaccine strategies. Joining us for today's discussion are Arnaud van der Rijt, Professor of Sociology, Department of Political and Social Sciences, EUI, Sandy Tuboeuf, Professor of Health Economics, Université Catholique de Louvain, and Amanda Glassman, Executive Vice President and Senior Fellow, Center for Global Development. For those of you participating via the digital platform, please submit your questions for the speakers in the Q&A tab. Last but not least, please tweet about the session using the hashtag SOU2021. Let me start with you, Arnout. You've been developing mathematical models on how best to stop the spread by targeted vaccination. Can you tell us about your research? Yes, uh, thank you, Adam. So let me begin by thanking you for organizing this panel on such an important topic. And it's also fantastic to be in the company of uh, yeah, two great experts on health policy, economics, and ethics. Um, yeah, so uh, what we've done in this research is ask how much leverage can we get out of um, the targeting of individuals with relatively a lot of contacts, uh, spreaders or super spreaders, we might want to call them, um, if we target those in vaccination campaigns. Um, and we'll get to the model in a, in, in a minute. So the, there's a couple of important observations uh, that I'd like to stress. The first is that the vast majority of um, SARS-CoV-2 infections come from a small minority of infected individuals. And we know this from contact tracing studies. Um, for example, there's a study that found that 80% of infections come from 15% of infected. But we also know from contact surveys, these are uh, surveys where people are asked over the course of two days, say, to track how many close range contacts they have with other individuals, is that those answers uh, vary hugely across individuals. So some people report many dozens of close range contacts, other individuals rarely um, you know, see many people on one day at all. Um, and these two facts are very plausibly uh, related. Yeah. But we also know from the same sur uh, contact surveys is that <clears throat> the people who have many close range contacts, they do not necessarily have shorter contacts. So some people really are exposing themselves and a lot of people um, with these many short range contacts over similar durations as other, uh, much more than other individuals. So there are huge differences in the risk that people uh, are exposed to and that they expose others to. Um, and so what we wanted to do is see what if you target your, vac your vaccines at those individuals, would, how much leverage would that give you um, in terms of controlling uh, the disease. And what we found was that there are huge differences. So uh, with, the, with a small minority of the vaccines that you would otherwise use, uh, you would be able to bring down uh, the spread of uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the population um, to the same degree. Now, how would you locate these people? Yes, so um, this is challenging. Um, there are two primary methods. So the one is a bit experimental. Um, this involves, you can start with any, with a random individual and ask this person, um, uh, please nominate a random contact of yours. And if you do that, then we know from network theory that you end up with someone who likely has many contacts because that makes them more likely to show up in the contact network of an individual. Uh, so this is a straightforward method. Um, you can of course also ask individuals you know, mention someone that you know has a lot of contacts that would probably be even more effective. Mm -hmm. um, but this is perhaps a, a strange procedure we're uncomfortable with. A uh, more tried procedure would be to go by profession. We know, um, we've also done research in this uh, direction. We know that some professions uh, expose people to many more contacts than other professions. And so targeting those professions uh, is an imperfect, but as a proxy for, um, for targeted vaccination would really work. So uh, you've talked about the importance of vaccinating people with high social contacts, but could you tell us a little bit more about how that compares to uh, 
random approaches like a lottery system or uh, vaccinating the aged? Uh, how, how, what's the difference in how much the vaccine, uh, the, the uh, virus would spread under these different uh, selection procedures for vaccinations? Yeah, so, okay, so it's really important here to make a distinction between, you know, reducing mortality and reducing the spread of uh, the disease, right? So we know that some groups are vulnerable. We know that the, uh, the, the mortality risk varies hugely to a like, factor of hundreds or thousands by age. Um, so giving vaccines to uh, people with much higher risk makes a lot of sense from that perspective. On the other hand, we also know uh, that if you give that same vaccine to a spreader, um, then this will bring down the, yeah, the, the presence of COVID in the population by a lot. Um, and that in itself is in the long run indirectly also pr protective of those vulnerable groups, um, mm -hmm. especially if we think of a world in which COVID is still increasing, the, a third world in which uh, vaccination has barely begun, um, and the possibility of variants are ultimately a threat also to the old people in society. So this this is uh, right. It's it's a balancing act between those two things. And then of course there's the, the thorny ethical issue of how do you make trade-offs. Mm -hmm. uh, with people's lives, and this is something that I know uh, the other panelists are able to speak to better than I than I can. Okay, thank you. That's a great segue because I wanted to go now to Sandy. Uh, you're an expert on ethics, so what can you tell us about these ethical trade-offs? Hi, hi everybody. Uh, nice to be here. So yeah, so what we have here is that we are a question of scarcity, and so this is an economic problem, and so when we have to allocate resources. We need to take into account that actually there are different elements that we want to maximize health, wealth, freedom. So what we have is actually too much demand for a small supply as well. So we needed to make choices. And in the case here of vaccination, what we wanted is to maximize the benefits. And so what I'm saying, maximizing the benefits is saving as much as possible lives. And so we caring here for those who are in needs. And this is most, mostly the strategy that has been taken by countries that actually we're close to. Most of them have been trying to go first towards people with the highest vulnerability of, you know, hard or poorer health status related actually to uh, having COVID. But then what we want as well is probably to mitigate uh, the health inequalities. And so trying to see which one are bearing, you know, the greatest burden of uh, COVID or maybe also those ones that are actually getting the greatest burden of being in lockdown or having actually their freedom in a way reduced. And so here, I guess, you know, this is always a question of trade-off. Which one of the two do matter the most? You know, which one actually do we value? What is worth? And we're trying to have an equal concern, but with few supply, actually, you must make choices. So you must value some before others. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we have in some countries, at least, uh, uh, or in the European Union as well, these ethics boards that are debating this. Uh, uh, can you make any comments on the results that have come out of this? Uh, do you have any observations about that? What choices they are making? So what I think, and I think it's, it's a common idea, you know, so I'm a health economist. And so I'm used to all those kind of choices in resource allocation. So we wouldn't say that actually we've not made choices already in many other contexts. You know, we do the same with cancer drugs, which one we found, which one we don't found, and rare disease. In the current context here, I think there is a very strong aversion to death. So the strategies that actually we've been putting in place have been trying to protect the people that were at high, higher risk of dying from, from COVID, but also trying to reduce as much as possible hospitalization or intensive care units. Because actually this has con consequences, not only on COVID patients, but also on other patients. So mm -hmm. I think here, you know, there is a race against the clock. And mm -hmm. so the only way actually to deal with this for all those ethics committee, it was actually trying to save, you know, the lives of those that were the most in need. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Now, um, there's been, I think now increasing talk about targeting by incidence rates. Uh, could you say anything about that? How would that work? And I think I think here, you know, the 
the target towards incidence rates is probably even related to the way that actually Arnoud was talking about his presentation or his work. Because I guess here, if we're going by incidence rate, we're trying to target zones, areas where actually we know that we have more cases. And so in a way, what we're trying is to clean up. So let's say some zones could be red or some others could be amber. And so our target is trying to make those one as green as possible. So then we're reducing here, you know, the contagion risk that actually we will have, which I think actually is a very efficient strategy because what we could do here is actually trying to focus the, the areas that are the most in need. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Amanda, let's move on to you now as a policy expert. How do you view the vaccine rollout in Europe versus the United States? Well, I mean, obviously, the European Union was a bit slower to uh, deliver and roll out vaccine when we compare it to the U.S., um, but that com convergence is sort of already happening. I think now uh, there's about 30 percent of people that are fully vaccinated uh, in both places, more or less, or, or, or getting near that. But I think if we look back at why it took a while for the European Union to catch up to the rest of the United States and the UK, I, I mean, I think I would go back to the uncertainty that we all experienced at the start of this uh, pandemic. Um, people didn't understand the nature of the virus very well or the extent of vaccination coverage that would be required and therefore the amount of vaccine that would need to be procured. And people also didn't understand well the reliability and adequacy of the supply chain that served that supply. Um, and especially if we became under stress and imagining that the entire world would be asking for that same supply at the same time. It was almost a failure of imagination. And I think um, that uh, sort of was a huge lesson in terms of contingency planning for crisis and how, you know, how many vaccine candidates you need to try and procure at the start given so much uncertainty, the need to be quite flexible on price and to understand that your delivery timing might have something to do with the price deals that you've struck. Um, so I think all of that is crystal clear to everyone uh, now uh, with consequences for the entire world um, because now the wealthy countries really have sort of worked through these issues in terms of the delivery dates and their vaccine contracts. And now the, the, the challenges for the rest of the world um, and, and we're all watching really with horror, the huge uh, amount of death and disease that's spreading in India and Brazil and others, other places um, that have much weaker health systems and are, are very ill prepared to be able to respond to the outbreak. Okay, now uh, one difference between the US and uh, Europe is the use of AstraZeneca. And I wonder if you could make some comments, what's happened with that? What's taking so long with the authorization and what you think about the data? Well, I mean, I think AstraZeneca is a very uh, efficacious and very safe vaccine um, and its science was available to the public very early. And so I think that was one of the reasons why the European Union opted to procure so much AstraZeneca and, and did not sort of take uh, more investment at risk for these other vaccine candidates that were less uh, visible uh, in terms of the science that was behind them and the, and the possible efficacy. Um, so that, you know, that's sort of where we started. I think the other issue, of course, again, is going back to the supply chain um, and how reliance on a couple of facilities, sometimes outside your geographical area, uh, really put at stake a lot of the ability to receive vaccine in a timely manner and respond. Um, so could it have been avoided? You know, I think a more diverse portfolio of vaccine candidates purchased up front, um, maybe less emphasis on large volumes of the best value vaccine, at least uh, at that moment in time, uh, was probably necessary. So thinking about redundancy in the way that we buy and deploy vaccine during emergency. Mm -hmm. And I only mention it's important to learn the lessons now because there's still a pretty large probability that there could be pandemic flu in the next you know, 10 to 25 years, there's a non-negligible probability that that happens. And would we be prepared for the next time? Yeah. Well, are there uh, things coming up now uh, that indicate sort of directions for needed changes in policies regarding vaccine approval or government investments in vaccines? Uh, you know, are there suggestions people are making? 
Well, I certainly uh, think that most countries are very interested in more disseminated manufacturing capacity for these essential public health vaccines. And we've seen countries like Germany provide a lot of support to Belgium to build greater manufacturing capacity. And so I think we'll continue to see that. Um, I think also the pressure to approve a large set of vaccines is fairly intense. At this stage, uh, some countries have approved the Gamalaya vaccine, for example, aka Sputnik, others have not. Uh, we did recently see, I think it was last week, that Brazil actually, Brazil's uh, medicines regulator has declined to approve the Gamalaya vaccine mm -hmm. because of the data that was proposed, but I know that some countries in the European Union have approved, and their data, some of their data and their studies are in the public domain. So. I think it just shows how important it is to really try and harmonize regulatory processes. The European Union has that, which I think is a, a nice uh, feature, should make it more efficient. Um, of course, the other uh, element at play here is a uh, patent waiver on the COVID-19 vaccines that was um, in play now at the World Trade Organization yesterday, the US trade representative announced uh, the US that the US was uh, going to support a waiver of intellectual property. That has implications for incentives to develop further manufacturing capacity. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, it's not totally clear that an IP waiver is what is going to free manufacturing capacity around the world and respond to the huge demand. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we're, we're involved in a big collective experiment uh, <laughs> testing how well these vaccines work, who needs to be vaccinated first. Um, and now, uh, what are the best incentives for manufacturing capacity? So we'll watch this space. Okay. Now, I would like to go back now to Sandy, because you've also done research on a public opinion on vaccine strategies. So we talked about efficiency and ethics, but what does the public find uh, fair? Um, can you tell us, first of all, about the different vaccine strategies that you asked the Belgian public to compare? Yeah, for sure. So what we did in that uh, in that study, which was actually very before we even had actually a first vaccine. So we did this in September, uh, last September. And so we considered actually eight different strategies, five of them related to uh, people characteristics. So what we had is that five different subgroups. So you could decide that you want to give the vaccine first to the people that are chronically ill, so that have a chronic disease. You could decide that you want to give the vaccine first to the people that are the older one, because they're also actually at risk of um, a difficult situation with COVID. You may want to vaccinate first uh, the essential professions. And what I mean by essential is just the professions that have continued working during uh, the lockdown in most countries. Then we could decide that we want to vaccinate first the socially active. And socially active individuals would be actually those that, because they have COVID, then they're, they're not working and this has a cost to society. Or we may want actually to vaccinate uh, the spreaders and which is very related to what Arnold was saying earlier. So people that actually are likely to spread to, to be much more contagious. And then there are actually other type of strategies that were not specific to the vaccination here, but that actually we've been already seen you know, being used when you have this kind of scarcity in resource allocation. So you may want to give it as a lottery. So randomly, you know, just give the vaccine randomly. And Arnaud was always talking about this kind of strategy earlier as well. We could also want to just give it to the first come first served person, you know, until actually we, we, uh, we don't have any more supply. Or we may want to do it as a market and actually give it to the, the highest bidder. So the person who is able to pay the most. And so these are different strategies that could be concerned, you know, that could be presented. And so we did actually present Belgians with those eight strategies and we asked them to rank them from their favorite or, but not in terms of personal preferences, but actually much more from a kind of societal viewpoint, which one did they think would be the most appropriate, the most suitable, and which one actually they really didn't think would be suitable. Now we're gonna to get to your results in a minute, but first I wanted to say, well, based on your research, uh, YouGov just fielded a study just for this uh, State of the Union panel that repeated your question. So we thank very much YouGov and especially Marcus Roberts for this help. 
And uh, they interviewed people between April 12th and April 27th this year. So just two weeks ago, basically. And I was wondering, Sandy, if you could say something about how the results we got, which I sent out on Twitter and I've provided to you, how do they differ from yours or what's, what are the similarities and differences, would you say? Yeah, so just that the study design was slightly different uh, because, you know, just to make it possible here. So that was slightly different from ours where actually people had just to look into each of those strategies and say whether they found it suitable. So in our mm -hmm. case, we were asking them to rank them, but it's pretty similar. And so what do we find with, uh, with the YouGov? is that the results are quite similar. Actually, that on one hand, you know, people have a high support for vaccinating first the chronically ill. Then they also wish to vaccinate the, the, the essential professions. And here there is a target on healthcare workers. So they really care about healthcare workers actually being vaccinated among the first one. And then the elderly. So this is very similar to what we had in, in our Belgian sample. Uh, there was a very low support for uh, the lottery system uh, or the highest bidder system uh, in most of the countries. And this is also what we had with Belgium, actually. People were not keen on having a lottery or actually giving the vaccine to those who could pay, you know, the highest amount. However, there is a slight uh, difference, you know, that is very interesting between YouGov and actually what we had in Belgium. The first come, first serve um, strategy was definitely not popular uh, in Belgium. However, what we had here uh, in the YouGov is that in some countries, and I think here we have Italy, we have Hungary, Greece, and Romania, where one person over three, and I think almost one person over two even in Greece, were finding this an appropriate strategy. So what they were actually, I think, going towards, you know, is trying to say that actually, if people are willing to be vaccinated, we should allow them to be vaccinated. And this actually could be efficient. So maybe there are some potential, you know, global gain with having more people vaccinated, which probably is to put in parallel with all this vaccine hesitation aspect. Okay, so um, these are very interesting results. And of course, we're going to have to uh, look more closely at these fresh results and uh, report back. Amanda, so far we've mainly spoken about uh, vaccine strategies in countries that have vaccines to distribute. Can you tell us about the COVAX, in, uh, COVAX initiative? What is it and what have been some of the problems? Yeah, so COVAX is the effort of the World Health Organization, the Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, UNICEF, CEPI and other agencies to pool the procurement of vaccination for 91 low in, lower, mid, lower income countries, not only low income, but lower middle income countries. Um, their goal was to purchase enough vaccine to uh, vaccinate about 20% of the population. And they, the, the guidance is that they should prioritize medical workers and the elderly in each of these countries. And it's a very, uh, we're talking about vaccine distribution strategies. What they decided very early was that it should be every country 20%, no more. And that um, as they got vaccine delivery into the COVAX facility, they would distribute it proportionally and equally across every country. So that itself has created some interesting situations. For example, if you're going to deliver a vaccine to Papua New Guinea or other Pacific islands, you don't really want to do it in small increments. You would rather, you know, go once to, to these just different places. So the cost of delivering the vaccine um, and, and protecting whole populations obviously differs between settings. So going back to this other discussion, but there's other issues with COVAX. One is that, you know, obviously buying for only 20% of the population, if there's no capacity or no financing from their own domestic revenues to buy more, that's insufficient to really deal with this COVID-19 problem as a public health issue. Countries can buy a bit more on top of that quota with their own monies. The financing for that is also problematic. Um, but what has also happened is that countries engage in bilateral deals with pharmaceutical companies on the side. And, and that affects everyone's uh, pooled procurement efforts, including the European unions, because if I'm doing a side deal, little side deals with Pfizer alongside um, these are other efforts, we, we might be affecting the delivery times uh, and different prices, et cetera, 
and, and there's not much visibility in the contracts that are in place in COVAX or elsewhere. And so it's hard for us to understand who's getting what, where, at what price, when. The other big challenge for COVAX has been the fundraising, even with this very modest goal of, of subsidizing 20% of vaccine uh, doses for the population. Um, they still have not met the funding requirements for that even small amount. Um, so this, this, I really think, is a failure of the international system. Uh, we should at least be able to say how much it would cost to get to the level of coverage that would reduce COVID-19 as a public health problem around the world, because we know that just vaccinating ourselves won't matter. I think uh, Arno mentioned earlier, if we allow the disease to spread unchecked elsewhere, that will develop variants, especially if they coexist with vaccine, it may affect the efficacy of the, efficacy of the vaccine as well. So we're playing a bit of a dangerous game now, um, and I'm hoping that in the next months we'll see more leadership from uh, the, the governments that own the international organizations and trying to set up a, a more coherent strategy for getting vaccine to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, could you say also something about uh, India? Because they do make a lot of vaccines. So what has been the problem there? It was a little bit similar to some of the problems we were discussing in the context of the European Union. They did not prioritize the procurement of doses for their own population. Uh, mm -hmm. They did buy a certain amount, um, but the, the I think it was equivalent to 15% of the population. And then uh, it was only at the end of March, 2021, that they started to say, we need more doses and to, to, to purchase enough to finance 50% of their population. Mm -hmm. The other difficulty that they're having is that they have decided to decentralize the purchase of vaccine to every Indian state, arguing that health is a state subject. That obviously has also created a chaos uh, in terms of the procurement. And then finally, um, the capacity of the Indian manufacturers to produce both for the international market and for the domestic market, uh, apparently those analyses were not based on the most accurate data, which uh, also suggests that we need to do better at understanding what manufacturing capacity really is, what are its limitations, and to develop, again, these sort of redundant arrangements that will enable us to have security of supply going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we have some now uh, questions coming in from the audience. Uh, and the first is that uh, our uh, the uh, poll questions from um, Sandy's study and from the YouGov uh, polling were put to the audience. And the uh, there weren't that many votes, but it's clear there was a clear uh, majority, 75% for prior prioritizing the essential professions and then one for uh, prioritizing the chronically ill. Now, Sandy, I understand that you kind of look at people in different clusters of what their ethical or fairness uh, conceptions are. Could you say something more about that? Because these seem to fit one of your groups. Yes, for sure. So the fact is that our study, if you want, our experiment was in a way with two steps. So while in the first steps, we were suggesting that people rank groups, you know, from the one that they found the most suitable to the one that is the least, you know, the strategy that is the least suitable. In the second part, we made it a bit more concrete. So we were giving, you know, two individuals, we were just showing a person A and a person B, and we we're describing those persons with uh, characteristics. So we were saying this person is older or younger, this person is a prof essential professional or not, this person is actually uh, has a chronic disease or not, this person is a high spreader uh, or low spreader, so, and then actually whether this person is socially active or not. And so what, the, this kind of methods are really nice because you just keep you know, characteristics, so two characteristics were similar in the two persons, and then they were differing in the level of the other three. And so how, you know, we were putting like 10 different choices and each time you had to decide as a person whether you would give the vaccine to person A or person B. So we were pushing people towards the choice, you know, this kind of discrete choices allowed us then to really understand what did people value in Belgium as being, you know, like a leading characteristic for vaccination priority. And so while in the large groups, people were indeed willing to vaccinate first the chronically ill, uh, the older people and the essential professions. Uh, in the second part of our study, 
the spreaders, so the people who were likely to spread more the disease, actually were becoming a bit more important uh, as, as a characteristic for defining priority. And so this was becoming important to the detriment of age. And so what I think we have here, which has also been found in some other research uh, that actually has been looking into priority, is that when you have an, a healthy older person, maybe actually you better use that dose of vaccine to a high propagator and actually prevent him from propagating much more. So like, do we get a better you know, value for society by vaccinating people that are spreaders of the disease instead of actually vaccinating someone who may be older, but still very healthy. And so you have as well, you know, this kind of trade-off. So I think what is interesting now in just, you know, the, the, the little uh, pool that you have is that in the end, people do value vaccinating the chronically ill and then the essential professions because they continue making the economy work. Age is always a bit of a tricky situation because with age, we may have actually people that are still extremely healthy and they might actually be able to wait a little bit for a vaccine. Okay, uh, we have another uh, question of the audience that might be a good um, uh, kind of transition to our final round. So I just thought, let me ask you all three what you have to say about this question, which is about vaccine hesitancy. Now, uh, what do you think about strategies for fighting that? And uh, some countries with high vaccine hesitancy in Europe, for example, Serbia, have just introduced monetary incentives for individuals who vaccinate. And this is a question from Tamara Popic. And as long as I'm mentioning the name of somebody who we don't see, I'd like to mention also Daniel Fernandez, who's our content moderator, who is passing these questions on to us. So thank you, uh, Daniel, and thank you also to Mar for the question. Arnaut, uh, what about you? Do you have anything to say about hesitancy? And what would be a smart strategy for? Well, I think that, um, that, I, that when we think about people's decisions of whether to get vaccinated themselves or the question um, that Sandy was concerned with, which is what would, what would be the ideal policy in, in your mind, I think, um, we are primed in our society to think about what is good for me or what is an individualized choice, right? So I think that people often forget that when they get vaccinated, they're protecting other people. Um, so it's not only about whether they believe, right, in, in information about what might happen to them, um, but, you know, they, they are probably not used to thinking in terms of network terms, right? This is a network system. Uh, you are in contact with others. If I get vaccinated, even if that poses a risk, which research uh, shows, you know, it's greatly outweighed by the benefit even at the individual level, um, then still that could have huge consequences for the people around us. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an important aspect here, I think. Amanda? And this is the same as true for super spreaders, right? So um, I think with, with epidemiology, uh, often I think it's, people are used to thinking in a linear way, but mm -hmm. things are often quadratic or exponential. Uh, mm -hmm. So we saw that very early in 2020 when uh, people have a hard time imagining that things one or two weeks later could be many times fold worse than they are today, uh, mm -hmm. which led to some delay perhaps in realizing how serious this was. Um, and I think this is also with super spreaders. Um, so when someone has double the number of contacts with someone else than someone else, that person is actually more than twice because not only is this person able to receive the virus from many more people, is then once it's in fact, we're also more likely to pass it on to many others. And so there's really a huge difference between someone who has many contacts and mm -hmm. someone who has few contacts. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this is about perception. Mm -hmm. Great. Amanda, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to address the main causes of vaccine hesitancy in the design of vaccine rollout. Um, so you've mentioned cash transfers. That's sort of a convenience or cost issue that might uh, affect some people's willingness to be vaccinated. And so, you know, to the extent that you're covering bus fares um, and, and these little uh, cash incentives can be very powerful. I, I work uh, with an organization that provides small incentives for childhood vaccination in, in a very difficult place, Northern Nigeria. And it's just for very poor families, it's a huge opportunity cost to go get vaccinated because you know, vaccination is the classic uh, maintenance uh, dilemma, right? If I do it, there nothing. Ha the best case scenario, nothing happens. 
So people actually don't want to spend uh, money for nothing, right? They want to get something. They're happy to go for a cure, uh, harder to convince them to go for prevention. So I think you know, to the extent that cash or other kinds of incentives helps with that problem of vaccine hesitancy, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, obviously, you have to be aware of the you know, not limiting intrinsic motivation and things like that. I think the, the other issue is this complacency issue that Arno is uh, describing. Um, and again, this, the failure of imagination just seems like a psychological trait of humans. Uh, we've had trouble throughout this entire epidemic of imagining the worst case scenario. And by not being able to imagine it, we've actually made it come true. So I hope that um, you know, at least policymakers can think differently about that. We don't, you know, there is of course the fear factor. We've seen the media filled with scary stories. Um, yeah, everyone is very alarmed. It's creating a, its own mental health epidemic. But at the same time, we do want to trigger people to get the vaccine. So you have to be afraid enough that you wanna protect yourself or protect others. And then finally, the issue of vaccine confidence. This, this is a really serious problem because of the extent of misinformation and social media. Um, and, and this does not start with COVID-19 vaccination. It started well before. Um, despite the, rel people have a lot of trouble assessing relative risks. Um, and uh, you know the, the side effects of a vaccine are so low compared to the risk of contracting COVID. And, and it's, people have a lot of difficulty um, processing that information, but, and I think we have not found ways to really battle the trolls online in ways that are effective. So I hope that we invest a lot of money in research on that, uh, how, we, how we can control uh, misinformation online a bit better. Okay, thank you. Sandy? Yeah, so I would join actually Amanda on the aspect related actually to paying or at least helping people because we know that it's kind of incentives work and actually when it's for the common good, you know, these are the kind of solution we could have. At the very beginning, you know, from my, my understanding of the situation and the work we've been doing, since the supply was anywhere limited, I think that actually it was possible only to vaccinate first those who wanted to be vaccinated. And what I was hoping is that you end up, you know, in this kind of virtuous circle where actually by having the people who were keen to be vaccinated first, they would actually be able to spread this to their peers, you know, with actually including people who were roughly hesitant, but actually that could see that things are working. And I guess, you know, this is probably what we're seeing now where we're having this kind of registrars in Belgium, it's actually working very well, where actually people can register, you know, to be vaccinated when there are some uh, doses, so then actually they're not wasted. And I can see that now there are more and more people who are willing actually to join this kind of registers. So what I guess, you know, is that the peer effects as well, you know, the, the benefits related actually to those that have already been vaccinated and that, that could feel a kind of freedom may help actually to convince the others. Of course, there is vaccine hesitancy, you know, even for other types of vaccines. So in any case, I guess, you know, this kind of reluctant 10%, we will not be able to do anything for them. But I think here in the case of COVID, a large share of the vaccine hesitant, it's related actually to the fact that it's very young, you know, that it's not a vaccine that we've been having for very long around. And so a lot of people are doubting because there are some new techniques that are being used. They feel like they don't have sufficient you know, background on this. But at some point, you know, success actually brings more success. Okay, now we are down to our last more or less 10 minutes. So I'm gonna ask you each to uh, make a, a final statement, whatever you have to say that you were not able to say before, but also we have one question from the audience. So perhaps you could combine with this from Kolya Rauba who asks, you know, how do you see that the actual uh, vaccine distribution and uh, both global and within the uh, EU really is in line with the uh, EU's commitment to solidarity. So if you could say something about the solidarity, but also your final words, why don't we go in the order of our panel, which is Arnaud, Sandy, and Amanda. So Arnaud, uh, any final words on this or on solidarity? Sure. Um, I mean, on solidarity, I think I want to emphasize a point that uh, Amanda made earlier, which is, of course, well, we might be well underway in Europe and US in vaccinating. We have we have a world out there that where people we've hardly seen. and as COVID rages around, uh, it will be able to experiment on variants uh, in the, the many hosts that it is able to infect. Um, 
And so the long-term challenge is, is bringing that under control somehow. And uh, you know, I hope that this, uh, this notion of targeting spreaders can help in that endeavor. Um, I think one thing that is, in, that is important to emphasize is that for, for a while we've thought that the, the primary target of the vaccination actually in the case of COVID was you know, preventing the worst cases. Um, and so that the vaccine is really a way to treat. Um, but uh, there are now really the last couple of weeks, many, many studies are coming out that show that uh, the vaccine really also cuts down on both the chance of getting infected as well as the chance of passing it on should you get infected nonetheless. Uh, so the vac uh, vaccination really is also an instrument uh, to, you know, to, uh, to be social. So if you take the vaccine, you know, you, you protect yourself, but you also protect others. Okay, Sandy? Yeah, so I really think here there are two, two aspects. So we cannot be too nationalistic and we can see it as well at the moment with, with India. So I guess, you know, there is a very common good and universal aspect in the vaccination that actually makes it needed that we need all you know, to make sure that everybody is vaccinated. What I really like as well is the fact that strategies can change. You know, I could see it in Belgium that from when they started in January and now in May, they are, they are changing the strategy. They are not only vaccinating the most vulnerable, they're also trying to go with the first come, first serve basis, which I think, you know, is beneficial to all of us because we need to think forward, you know, about the variants. So I'm really, you know, quite interested to see how many countries will be changing, you know, the strategy by observing, observing the UK, observing uh, the US and actually trying to learn. So there is an opportunity here, you know, even maybe to change the way that we've been having a lot of public health strategies, you know, in, in the future. So I think the implementation is actually like we're learning by our mistakes and we're probably, you know, improving at the same time as we, we're making mistakes. So I, I really hope that actually we'll have a much larger generosity towards actually vaccinating as well in other countries that are poorer, that don't have access you know, to vaccine at the moment, because this will have consequences otherwise anyway on the success of our own strategy nationally. Thank you. Amanda? So um, I, I did want to flag that again, this uh, between country equity issue, because even within the European Union, there are differences between H Hungary, the highest performer in terms of doses administered per 100 uh, people versus Latvia, I guess, that's still at 15 uh, doses per 100 people. So there, there's enormous uh, differentials within even uh, you know, relatively well-off regional blocks. And likewise, you know, in the United States, we see uh, pretty large equity differentials between ethnic groups, um, between uh, people, um, immigrants and non-immigrants. So uh, th this is something that we have to take into account too when we design vaccination strategies for the future. And I, of course, share the view of my co-panelists that, uh, that really important to look at the entire world when we think about equity and effectiveness and vaccine delivery. Um, it's often said, but still true, that no one is safe until everyone is safe in the case of this disease. So how, how well we can manage it, how speedily we can get to minimum levels of coverage everywhere really determines our collective uh, outcome here. Okay, um, so I want to thank you all. We have a little bit of uh, extra time if somebody wants to make a further comment. Uh, maybe I could go back to you, Amanda, because uh, you had said your overall evaluation is that things were not as terrible as they might have been. Uh, what, you know, despite mistakes, what, what is your overall assessment uh, as a policy expert? Well, I mean, I, first I would say that, you know, every, every day and week in this process has felt like a year. So uh, the part of the difficulty of this response is that, you know, when we look at the speed of the research and development and manufacturing process, uh, it's historically fast. Um, and I think in general, the high income countries very much did the right thing in terms of investing in a portfolio, a diversified portfolio of vaccines, buying before uh, even the trials were finalized to be able to deliver vaccine very quickly thereafter. Of course, 
it would have been better if it had been faster, but I think we all have to remark on that. And I think another great outcome of this process that, that our, our colleagues were referring to is the, the real-time science that is going on alongside. Um, there's, I would say it's a bit better on the clinical trials part and not so great on the social science part on the delivery, testing of delivery strategies and the kinds of experiments that Sandy was talking about um, which are not experiments, these are about what is what do people feel is the right thing to do given what we know about the disease and its impact. Um, that has been sorely lacking in the United States. We did not have uh, this kind of polling to understand whether people were in favor with what the technical, the technocratic committee assessing cost effectiveness um, and priorities and delivery uh, have done. Uh, so I see a huge uh, future agenda. I hope that we use this opportunity to prepare for the next pandemic and to invest in the structures that will enable us uh, to not just to develop good technologies, but to deploy them and to deploy them with equity and to deploy them everywhere. Now, one final uh, question on this also, as I understand the time to, not just the time to develop the vaccine went in a record short time, but also the, the global uh, diffusion has actually been fast. We're frustrated now and we see all these people who are getting sick, but it's still faster than uh, with other vaccines as I understood it. Yeah, absolutely. This is, um, you know, when you look at the pace of technology diffusion, uh, the, you know, polio, everyone says, oh, the polio vaccine, uh, we should have made, you know, the polio vaccine, it took many years for that vaccine to reach from, to go from the United States to the rest of the world. And in fact, there's still wild polio in Pakistan and Afghanistan today because we don't have adequate vaccination levels. So, uh, you know, and then in normal circumstances, even for something like, uh, even after the creation of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, whose mission is really to shorten those timeframes, the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine against, um, you know, certain kinds of childhood pneumonia, uh, we had it in high income countries 20 years before uh, we actually had this show up, or the, sorry, the, the PCV one was like five years, but anyhow, we're talking about weeks of difference in this case uh, mm -hmm. for COVID-19. So you know, we are still slow to roll out, but I think uh, we don't appreciate enough how quickly, how, how we've been able to make the time frame shorter. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Amanda, Sandy, and Arnaud. Uh, this has been very informative. Uh, to our audience, uh, thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next panels, which will be starting at quarter of two, uh, so in about uh, an hour and 20 minutes. So thanks again.